let's start rehabilitation of stroke patients. That's a very broad topic. Can you speak up, please? Okay, I'm trying. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> So um, probably by far you already heard this uh, over and over again, but I have to emphasize um, one more time. Uh, stroke is still the leading cause of death, and the first 30 days has high mortality. So we have to be aware of, you know, while we are treating the patient in the inpatient rehab, there's a 17 to 30 percent of mortality. Um, potentially. So the stroke also is the leading cause of adult disability. Uh, at least 25 to 50 percent of stroke survivors are partially or totally dependent in ADLs. So there's a potential um, market and huge demand for innovative treatment uh, developing for stroke patient population. Uh, I still believe neural rehab holds the future for um, PMR field. So today I'm go gonna go over some of the topics, um, why the patient need a specialized stroke rehabilitation program, and what is a stroke recovery mechanism, the prognosis, um, the common post-stroke complication and treatments. In the end, I'm gonna update on some research uh, current research on innovative rehabilitation treatment. So let's see a case scenario at first. 73-year-old Mary Mayo suffered right MC stroke. Uh, he was seen by a neurologist. Got imaging, as we show over here, a moderate size of infarction, antiplatelet agents and studying was prescribed as secondary stroke prevention, consult rehab, the PMR physician was overwhelmed by the working load, saw the patient four days later, put him on the waiting list for admission. Four days later, he was admitted to a general rehab unit. With assessment a weekend, patient um, started the treatment 17 days after stroke. So this is probably quite common scenario when we are in the council service. Is this a good care? Could we do this better? Is this good? All right, so <laughs> the good thing is, you know, the patient is a potentially very good rehabilitation candidate. Um, the drawback of this scenario, the patient was admitted to a general rehabilitation unit and the treatment was delayed. So the question is, what is a specialized about the stroke rehabilitation program? What is the difference? Um, than other general rehab unit, and what is the optimal window to start treatment? So in order to answer those questions, we have to understand a little bit better about the mechanism of stroke recovery. So probably you have heard this before, there are two stages of recovery. Um, one is the spontaneous recovery, um, which the mechanism behind the spontaneous recovery are resolution of edema, recovery from diastasis. What are diastasis? Diastasis is a disrupted neuron, functionally or structurally connected to the damaged neuron, or restoration pre-morbid neurotransmitter level, or resolution of the uh, penubra. So in the acute care, the thrombolysis or surgical intervention, what they do, they try to reverse the injury, reduction of the damage size of the brain. So if consideration of the 10 to 20% of the stroke patient are eligible for those intervention, mm -hmm. the stroke rehab still, you know, the mainstay of the treatment for um, stroke patients to improve the functionality. The neuroplasticity, is a training-induced um, plasticity. The definition of the neuroplasticity is the ability of the nervous system to respond to intrinsic or extrinsic stimuli by re reorganizing its structure, function, and connections. The changes in the process of neuroplasticity are several changes. 
increase the number of the synapses or synaptogenesis, as we've shown here, or changes to the axon, such as axonal sprouting, or unmasking um, subserved brain area to replace the function of the damaged brain function. So neuroplasticity is not necessarily time limit. Um, different from the spontaneous recovery. Spontaneous recovery generally within three to six months stagnates. So this is another picture trying to show the cerebral cortex activation, reorganization, and rewiring after stroke. So from the initial injury, if you have primary motor cortex lesion, then the in homologous, the opposite side of the brain is recruited. Then the activation of the cerebral cortex with the brain recovery diminished, then this activation shifts back to the injury site, resulting in the motor recovery. Whether rehabilitation can induce neuroplasticity, the answer is yes. So when we look at the cortical map, of the monkey brain 12 weeks after infarct in the primary motor area of the hand. As we can see, without rehabilitation, you have some reorganization at the peri-infarct area. In of rehabilitation, you can see the increased representation of the hand resulting in the um, better outcome of the motor functional recovery. So, in summary, active training enhances neuroplasticity and results in reorganization of cortical maps. So recovery happens to some part spontaneously by resolving injury-related factors, but also due to neuroplastic process. Repeated activity and training triggers neuroplasticity, which modifies the central nervous system to recover functionality. Since we know the rehabilitation is very important to induce neuroplasticity, so what are the key factors um, in terms of the rehabilitation treatment? There are manifold. So there are a group of important factors are related to intensity of the treatment. Another important group of factors are related to the manner, how the training is carried out. And other factors is um, including psychological state of the patients and the, or the amount of information or feedback the patient received. So in terms of intensity of therapy, so we, as we know, generally inpatient rehab, the patient has to be compliant three hours uh, therapy rule. So any evidence behind the three hours? Why three hours? Do we know? How about four hours, five hours, or one hour? <laughs> yeah, actually, when you look at the um, diagram, the longer duration of the therapy uh, is closely related to the better outcome. So um, there's only one research su study showed the threshold duration for optimal outcome in stroke inpatient is three hours therapy per day. But generally, the longer duration of the therapy related to the more the amount of uh, repetition you perform with certain functional tasks. So evidence from the animal model um, suggests there are 400 to 600 amount of repetition are necessary to um, making the neuronal structural changes for upper limb. And there's a 1,000 to 2,000 steps are needed for improving walking. Consider the numbers um, to the amount of repetition in current rehab rehabilitation setting, the number are much smaller. So the repetition is very important not only for the motor relearning or stroke patient, and also for our learning process. If you don't know your anatomy, that means your repetition is not enough, didn't induce the neuroplasticity, didn't store in your long-term memory yet. So um, in general, more therapy hours results in better outcomes. Why 
you know, we have three hour therapy rule because it's strongly controlled by the available manpower and money. So in the future, we are hoping longer duration therapy in higher intensity of the program will be developed. So in that's one of the reasons um, robot assistive therapy uh, is under a lot of research. So another component of intensity of therapy is how difficult the tasks are for the patient. As we can see, um, more complex tasks enhance short and long-term neuronal changes based on the evidence. Um, but if the um, patient overwhelmed by certain functional tasks, the task difficulty has to be um, evaluated to the optimal level to promote op optimal learning zone <clears throat> to uh, accelerate the motor relearning. As we can see here, it's a bell-shaped curve. So the performance is not necessarily correlate to the potential learning benefit. Um, as a resident, if you carry five patients, probably that's your comfort zone, but doesn't mean you're going to you know, in your optimal learning zone. So if you carry 25 patients, probably performance and the learning all decreased. So it's happened um, to the stroke patient also with the motor relearning, mental effort um, challenge is very important, but support and guidance has to be provided um, to avoid over challenge. <laughs> So in terms of how to carry out therapy, that's also very important for neuroplasticity and functionality improvement. So there's um, a lot of factors um, can be improved in the manner of the um, therapy. So what I want to emphasize is the specificity and shaping. The benefit of task specific training uh, has been shown by multiple motor learning uh, research. So task oriented training can improve function and changes cortical activation. And also the practice has to be um, with the real objects significantly improves the reaching kinematics based on the research study. So let the patient reach out to grab a, gu a glass of water instead of balls, so they can be more motivated and more mental effort involved. That shows a better outcome for the motor relearning. And also we need to transfer the practice to the real life situation as close as possible to facilitate daily task. So that's the reason, you know, on the rehab floor, you have ADL suites that the patient practice in the real life environment, including the community outing. Um, that's all the ways to, uh, right ways to carry out therapy. Another very important concept is the shaping. So what is the shaping? Shaping learning method, which is, you know, desired motor or be behavioral objective is approached in small steps. And when the performance is successful, um, the patient are reinforced by verbal encouragement. As you can see over here, so the performance for successful at any point are small. The benefit of shaping is an important way for enhancing recovery success, especially in the upper limb, especially um, there's research showed in the constraint induced movement therapy, shaping is very important. Another question I raised before is when to start the therapy. So in order to maximize the effectiveness of rehab, rehabilitation treatment, it's critical to determine what is the um, period for brain mostly responsive to sensory motor experience to improve the motor outcome. As we can see over here, this animal study, they trying to compare the efficacy of five weeks of enriched rehabilitation initiated at five days, 14 days, and 30 days after ischemic stroke. 
So when we see the recovery for them reaching ability, the square mm -hmm. line is from the rehabilitation treatment started after five days, which shows significant gains when the rehabilitation was initiated early, like five days. Initiated 14 days, there is some motor recovery, but to a lesser extent. If initiated 30 days after stroke, they didn't show much differ than um, the animals exposed only to social housing. There's another, another study showed um, the stroke patients, if they received a very early intensive mobilization within 24 hours after stroke, then they returned to unassisted walking faster than the patient who only received the standard care. And the efficacy can be maintained after three months. But there's a one result from animal study uh, suggest the very intensive, intensive therapy after hours after stroke showed increased the size of the brain lesion. So the optimal window still not established, but the earlier the rehabilitation start, we can see the better outcome. Based on the understanding of the motor relearning and neuroplasticity, so current recommendation is a best practice in stroke rehab involves specialized interdisciplinary teams working in a highly to obtain best outcomes. So the specialized interdisciplinary stroke program is a gold standard. The patient family centered um, model involving multidisciplinary team um, including assessment, individual goal setting, multimodal therapy, re-evaluation is a current recommendation. And the coordination of the teamwork, um, including medical, nursing, therapy staff, expertise in stroke rehabilitation um, is coordinated in the, through the weekly meeting as we have a conference, um, team conference mm -hmm. every week. So we di discuss the progress and set up the individual goal for each individual patient. The whole process involves patient and family. So there's a considerable amount of evidence show the patient has better clinical outcome in current setting instead of in the general rehabilitation unit. There are five more um, patients returned to in uh, independence from every 100 patients if treated in stroke rehabilitation program then treated in the general rehab floor. Depends on the uh, severity of the stroke and the functional level of the stroke, um, there's, um, in addition to intensive, in, there are other options like day hospital, subacute rehab, still host therapy are available for stroke recovery. In order to match the patient to appropriate setting, we need to know the prognosis of the stroke. So there are certain specific negative predict factors. Um, severity of the stroke, that's very important, correlate to the stroke prognosis, and history of previous stroke, major comorbidities, poor cognitive function, bowel and bladder incontinence, viral spatial deficits, hemianopsia or hemineblat, poor upper extremity motor function, lack of motor recovery after one month, low functional score on mission, age, are the negative predictive factors. On the contrary, if uh, the patient don't have those negative factors, generally they have better prognosis and most likely gonna be discharged to a community. Brownstone recovery pattern, probably this is, uh, you have heard this um, many times, I wouldn't go through each single stages, but um, you have to remember not every single patient goes through every single stages. And any time they can stop, a stop at any stage. So some patient may present with a spastic hemiparesis for a prolonged period of time without recovery. 
the show recovery pattern when the patient has synergy generally um, flexor is more common in the upper stream T and extensor is more common in the lower stream T. And these have to be evaluated in the dynamic situation and not to be confused with it. So especially the lower stream T, you have to look at the synergy pattern when the patient in the ambulation or in the movement. In terms of the stroke recovery, uh, most of the stroke are, are from MCA stroke. So the motor recovery follows some patterns. Uh, generally, the weakness more affected in the arm than the leg be because of the homologous distribution. But the recovery started from the lower extremity prior to the upper extremity and proximal before distal. That's the reason you know, most of the stroke survivor will suffer upper limb paresis. Um, although they can have ambulatory function. There's certain um, timeline we need to be aware of, then we can communicate with the patient and family better yeah. in terms of the motor prognosis. If occurs, generally the full recovery uh, within three months. Most recovery happens three to six months. Um, after six months, if significant partial return of voluntary movement continues, recovery may last longer. Per prognosis for motor recovery, if no recovery within three, three weeks, um, that means you know, the recovery is going to be prolonged. And motion one segment is not followed by another within one week, um, then the prognosis will be poor. That means if you see the shoulder recovery, but now followed by the elbow recovery after a week, then probably the recovery is going to be prolonged. Some recovery within four weeks in terms of the arm, then 70% have good recovery. Uh, if you, we didn't see any motor recovery within four weeks, no grip strength within four weeks, that means per prognosis. So we have to remember the first month is pretty important for um, the prediction of the motor recovery. And most of the time, the patient are still in the inpatient rehab. So that's the reason the physical examination when we do the daily rounds are very important. We're not just you know talking to the patient without touching the patient. At least you have better idea um, after physical examination whether the patient is going to have a better mm -hmm. recovery or not. In terms of ambulation, actually majority of the survivors will recover ability to ambulate at least a short distance without assistance. However, um, less than 50% will achieve limited community ambulation. And if within one week, the lower stream T strength can recover greater than three out of five, most likely the patient will, will walk. So if you have patient have a very good um, strength proximally in the lower stream T. When you are on a mission, that means the patient most likely will walk. However, after stroke, the endurance will be impaired. Most of the patient wouldn't um, reach the community <laughs> level of the walking. The speed is much slower. Um, the normal walking speed is 85 meter per minute, post stroke probably 15 meter per minute. And even with the walking aid assistant device, only can reach 25 meter per minute. So that's the reason when the patient asks you whether I can walk, most likely they can walk, but they cannot um, walk appropriately as uh, their baseline anymore. <coughs> In terms of fascia, the incidence of the patient experiencing a fascia. Um, however, the fascia will recover. Most of the patient will recover at six months, and the recovery is slower and lasts longer than the motor recovery, but depends on the size of the lesion. And recover is more individual-based and more variable. Um, recovery uh, can occur beyond one year. Hemianopsia, if the hemianopsia doesn't return within three weeks, that means poor prognosis. And we have to emphasize the scanning technique for the compensatory strategy. 
perceptual, generally um, the great, greatest recovery will happen within three to six months later as possible. So the next topic I would like to address is uh, during the inpatient rehabilitation, like the case scenario, the patient was admitted to the inpatient rehab. So what we are treating um, as a physiatrist, uh, there are a long list of uh, complication, um, control medical complication, that's where daily task, um, and also post bladder bowel management, spasticity, wear monitor, nutrition, hydration, hemiplegic shoulder pain, some orthopedic joint problem. I think probably you already have lecture from um, other attendings. We provide equipments, optimize medications, we're treating depression, post fatigue, and sexuality dysfunction. Um, among the list, I'm going to focus on postural bladder, bowel, uh, bladder management and also hemiplegic shoulder pain. Of course, secondary stroke prevention is very important. Although the patient um, already on secondary stroke prevention, um, agents, while they are entering patient rehab, we have to be aware of, you know, the patient need to be educated and family need to be educated <coughs> since when they are in the acute rehab, uh, acute setting, they are very overwhelmed. They didn't um, remember what happened to them. So um, we need to be aware of the guideline, current guideline from the American Heart Association. Uh, depends on the etiology of the stroke, what, are the, what kind of treatment the patient need. So the same patient was noticed to have urinary incontinence on re rehab admission. What are potential causes of his urinary incontinence? What are the treatments? I think, you know, every day we're treating uh, urinary incontinence um, on the rehab floor. There are a lot of causes in the treatments uh, are limited. So the problems of urinary incontinence generally uh, can range from 32 to 83 percent, but the incontinence can improve. So on discharge, generally 25 to 28 percent patient have the urinary incontinence. After one year or two year, the percentage is much smaller. Um, this is a pathway of the uh, bladder control. As we all know, there's a parasympathetic, sympathetic, somatic pathway to control the bladder. It's very complicated. I think you already got lecture from spinal cord injury in, term, in terms of the neurogenic bladder. So what I emphasize is the neurogenic bladder after stroke is different from spinal cord injury. When you can see over here, um, So the bladder controlled by the sympathetic pathway and parasympathetic pathway. And there's a pontine maturation center. If um, the parasympathetic pathway and the sympathetic pathway, the coordination is accomplished by this center. If you have injury <clears throat> between the pontine and sacral cord, that means spinal cord injury, you have um, the detrusor sphincter dysynergy. So the coordination, you lost the coordination of two pathway. But if you have the lesion above the pontine maturation center, the presentation is different. So the pontine maturation center uh, activation will lead to the dominance of the parasympathetic pathway. That means detrusor activation, sphincter relaxation, the patient have the voiding episodes. And the pontine maturation center receive a lot of signals through the cortical and sub subcortical area, including cerebral cortex, basal ganglion, thalamus, hydro, uh, hypothalamus, cerebellum. So all these inputs, signals, uh, inhibit pontine maturation center. Um, when the socially appropriate situation, the patient have voluntary expulsion of the urine.
So from this cartoon, we can see if we don't have the inhibition from the cortical area to the pontine maturation center, what happens when the bladder fills, the afferent um, signal transmit to the spinal cord, sacral spinal cord, and transmit to the pontine maturation center without inhibition, then the excitatory stimulus for bladder contraction will not be controlled by the uh, voluntarily. So no matter whether it's socially appropriate and the patient feel urgency, um, urinary incontinence. So the neurogenic bladder after stroke is a loss of cortical inhibition. We call the detrusor overactivity. So the PVR is small. Um, generally, it's a low volume. Um, patient is able to empty the bladder. However, in the cerebral shock phase, the early phase, like spinal shock, and the patient has uh, age reflexia bladder, that means failure to void. And generally, we provide supported uh, care, like intermittent catheter or Foley, depends on the functional level of the patient. If patient is not able to transfer, probably we can start with the Foley. However, we recommend remove the Foley as early as we can. Uh, intermittent caster has uh, uh, less risk of infection. Medication-wise, we use alpha blocker or cholinergic ag agonist. However, because of the side effect profile, we rarely used um, in the rehab setting of the cholinergic agonist. Then the later phase, loss of cortical inhibition of the voiding reflux, failure to stall, replace the urinary retention. At this phase, um, behavioral treatment is a mainstay treatment. So as we all know, we can pro provide bedside commode, timed voiding. Um, some patients need a full restrictions. In terms of medication, anti-muscarinic therapy is a mainstay treatment. However, because of the side effects, uh, including dry mouth, blood vision, constipation, uh, for some cognitive impairment patient, probably is not uh, optimal for them to use. We have to be uh, cautious in the stroke patient population. The efficacy of the overall um, for antimuscarinic therapy is not, that, is not that great. So other treatment available, uh, intractable uh, urinary urgency, incontinency, <coughs> sacral neuromodulation or detrusor injection of the Botox are available. However, if the patient um, is a diabetic male with an obstructed prostate, had a stroke, so the patient may present it much more complex uh, etiology for the urinary retention mm. or ur urinary uh, incontinence. So in order to treat the neurogenic bladder, we have to obtain detailed um, history from the patient, whether they have urology history, whether they are on any medications such as sedatives, hypnotics, anticholinergics, antipsychotics, antihistamine, antispasmodics, opiates, adrenergic and calcium channel blockers, and most likely a lot of patients are on those medications. And whether a patient has other medical comorbidities, how's their fluid intake status, and their ADLs, how supportive the nursing um, assist in their lifestyle. So in order to appropriately treat um, or find out the etiology of the uh, bladder problem, you have to rule out all the reversible causes like delirium, infection, urethritis, um, diabetes, or other endocrinology problem. Uh, the patient's restricted mobility can cause urinary problem and stool in uh, impaction. Another common scenario I want to uh, present over here on the rehab floor is the same patient uh, with a right hemispheric stroke, complains the left shoulder pain. On examination, he has subluxed shoulder, marked pain on minimum external rotation, and 
restriction. So, that, so this is quite common um, if the patient has uh, hemiparesis, hemiplegic. We can see the picture. There's a clearly uh, subluxed shoulder. The prevalence, uh, prevalence of the hemiplegic shoulder pain um, can range from 16 to 72 percent of the stroke patients, and the pain generally starts within three weeks of the stroke, um, correlate with the witness and stroke severity. Other risk factors are sensory abnormalities, spasticities, red hemispheric stroke, because the patient generally present with the knee flat they uh, had the trouble handling the shoulder, uh, all the low functional level. So as we can see over here, generally the subluxation is a one of the cause of the pain. Um, generally you use the width of the finger breast to do the clinical diagnosis. You don't need a, um, to diagnose the subluxation. Pain, uh, shoulder pain has a broad differential diagnosis. You can have rotator cuff tendinitis, brachial plasticity, subluxation, spasticity, CRPS, frozen shoulder. So the reason I highlight, highlight CRPS, we have this is one of the most common etiology for hemiplegic shoulder pain. And the, generally you have to know this to answer the board exam or SAE. This theoretic framework describing the um, postulate initial uh, initial weakness and spasticity can cause the immobility and pain, uh, instability of the glenohumeral joint. Then um, the instability of the glenohumeral joint, the condition, can directly cause pain or place the shoulder astrocapsular or capsular soft tissue um, through the macro or macro trauma, which can cause degenerative or inflammatory, um, it's not, inflammatory um, changes, which can cause more, more pain and immobility. As we revealed earlier, the repetitive um, Functional use of the pyretic arm is very important for the motor recovery. However, the immobility will exacerbate the state of the pyretic muscles. Because of the you know, multifactorial and the etiology is very complicated, so the current management and the result of the management are not very satisfied. Um, the management generally we um, is different when the shoulder in the flaccid phase or spastic phase. So when the flaccid phase positioning is very important, uh, as we all know, slings are still very controversial. As we can see, if we use slings, we generally use the cuff type slings and instead of the swath type of slings, which may promote loss of range of motion of the shoulder. In the spastic phase, um, the promote the range of motion by different modalities, Botox injection or phenoblock are very important at times to help maintain the range of motion to help the recovery of the pain. Because of the management is very challenging, so the early joint protection strategy I have to emphasize over here is a key before developing the shoulder pain. Um, positioning and supporting the arm during rest, functional mobility, wheelchair use by using hemitrial arm trough. During the flaccid stage, slings can be used, especially when the patient in the upper population um, can be used, but not all the time. And also overhead pulleys should not be used. Um, overhead pulley generally be used for the frozen shoulder, but for the hemiplegic shoulder pain, we don't recommend. The arm should be moved beyond, uh, should not be moved beyond 90 degree of shoulder flexion or abduction unless the scapular is upwardly rotated and humerus is laterally rotated. 
So we want, um, when we have a subluster shoulder, we want to make sure the humeral head um, in the glenal cavity before move the shoulder. And patient and caregiver and staff had to be educated to correctly handle the involved arm. Some research uh, studies showed electric stimulation of the um, treatment. Neuromuscular uh, electric stimulation shows some beneficial for hemiplegic shoulder pain. There's a two kinds of uh, neuromuscular electric stimulation. One is a transcutaneous, another one is a percutaneous functional electric stimulation. Um, the mechanism are different, transcutaneous, it just stimulates through skin surface. However, the efficacy is not um, very well established. The percutaneous electric stimulation generally is a direct stimulation of the target peripheral nerve or motor points. There's a small study uh, using the intramuscular electric stimulation for hemiplegic shoulder pain management. As we can see over here, there's a 61 chronic stroke patients received percutaneous electric stimulation to the supraspinatus, mid diatoid, posterior diatoid, superior trapezius, six hours a day for six weeks. And when they look at the pain reduction, um, the Intervention group showed much more successful rate compared to the control group. And also the efficacy maintained even after uh, 12 months. However, you know, this is um, currently only have very small uh, clinical trials. The sample size is small. Uh, we, in summary, the neuromuscular electric stimulation is effective in reducing shoulder subluxation, increasing pain-free range of motion, facilitating motor recovery, especially for those in the acute phase of stroke, uh, when the patient is still in the flaccid phase and has the subluxed shoulder. But larger multi-center single-blinded randomized clinical trial is needed. Since we know the CRPS is one of the common ideology for hemiplegic shoulder pain, so I want to talk a little bit about the CRPS type 1. The prevalence CRPS type 1 in hemiplegia ranges from 12.5% to 70%. So variability uh, because of the, the current diagnosis um, is pretty challenging. Um, because of the diagnosis challenge and the treatment can be challenged too. Currently, there's a clinical, based on the clinical signs and the symptoms from the International Association for the Study of Pain, IASP, they uh, have the standard how to make clinical diagnosis of CRPS. Generally, we use synonymous stamp, means you, know, you look at the sensory, trophies, autonomic changes, motor, and pain to diagnose. The gold standard is a triple phase bone scan. Um, however, the increased uptake in the delayed phase of the triple phase bone scan um, is not detectable at the early phase of the CRPS. The reason the mechanism for CRPS is uh, still unknown. There are several proposals of the pathophysiologists to cause the CRPS. It may come from hyperactivity of the sympathetic nervous system, changes in the peripheral nervous system, or alteration in the thalamic perfusion, cortical sensory abnormalities, impaired bio biomechanics of the glenohumeral joints, or local inflammation of the affected extremities. Treatment. Um, there are uh, analgesic treatment, um, however, it's not very successful. Some research studies show the oral steroid or biphosphonate, so some beneficial effects. For some patients, um, they respond to steroid ganglion block because of the increased sympathetic, sympathetic activity is one of the etiology for CRPS. The cornerstone of the treatment currently is interdisciplinary approach involving PT, OT, 
um, to reduce the edema, desensitization, maintain the joint range of motion. Um, some studies show the mirror therapy can be beneficial and patient generally associated with the depression and also anxiety. So the psychological factor has to be considered. The same patient um, with the right hemisphere stroke had a significant left neglect to confront, uh, confrontational testing, as we can see over here, block drawing, midline bisection. bisection um, we can tell the patient has left neglect. So what are treatments are available? So generally the right hemispheric uh, stroke with the left neglect has a much poorer prognosis than um, the patient even have the aphasia, motor deficits. Um, they require more assistance down the road. Um, that's one of the you know, um, per prognos per prognostic predictor, neglect. And it's generally um, hard to treat and hard to detect. Um, the therapist has more experience and more uh, modality to test the patient. But in order to com communicate well, with the therapist and provide the appropriate treatment for the patient, at least we have to know how to identify the neglect. There's two main classification system. One's using in terms of the modality in which the behavior is elicited, sensory motor representational. Another classification is based on the distribution of the um, abnormal behavior, such as personal neglect or extrapersonal neglect, uh, spatial neglect. So by definition, sensory neglect is uh, decreased awareness, awareness of the sensory stimuli on the side of the body or space opposite the brain lesion in one or more modalities, including visual, auditory, and tactile. So the patient cannot um, digest the multiple stimulation. Generally, the intent to the stimuli uh, presented to the contralateral side of the lesion. Motor neglect, um, by definition, is decreased ability to generate a movement response to stimulus, even though the person is aware of the stimulus. So sometimes you can, it's hard to differentiate the motor neglect from the hemiplegia, real hemiplegia. Um, when you ask a patient to move their Paratic limb for the real hemiplegia patient generally at least they show some efforts. They tend to move the paratic limb, but motor neglect patient they appears not making any efforts, not attempting to move. Representational neglect is ignoring the contralational half of the internally gener generated image, or we call imaginary ne neglect. So this is uh, interesting because when you present a scene to the patient, patients are able to uh, identify each single object in the scene. However, when you ask the patient to um, recall what they saw earlier, they only recall the part, you know, ipsolesional side of the um, scene. So this is called imaginary neglect. Another classification is a personal neglect. Um, we all understand that's a lack of exploration or awareness of the side of the body opposite side, uh, opposite to the brain lesion. Astropersonal neglect is spatial neglect, so failure to acknowledge stimuli on the contralateral side of space. So when they eat, probably they just you know ignore the side of the contralateral lesion side. Current neglect treatment, um, generally we use a lot of verbal cues to cue the patient, train the patient to scan the um, neglected space or environment, or we reposition the patient, give the patient more stimulus on the neglected side. 
some other behavioral treatment, probably um, the uh, other attending has mentioned before, um, the prism therapy. They can shift image from the left side, left side environment to um, the viral field of the patient. After adaptation, then the patient will pay more attention to the left side if the patient has left neglect. Eye patching, hemiglasses, they force the patient to uh, have opposite gaze uh, to pay attention to the environment. However, based on the research study, generally they work better for the left neglect patients than the right neglect patients. Um, the calorie stimulation generally we um, not very common in the inpatient rehab setting. Another one is a constraint induced therapy not only useful for improve the motor recovery and can help the neglect. In terms of pharmacological treatment, there's uh, no you know, very big clinical trial have a conclusion which medication can help with the neglect, but generally dopamine agonists such as you know, Ritalin, bromocryptine can have some uh, beneficial effect based on the small study.